which is Terrell Hall of Fame D line. This is Bully Rance. Uh, this one is particular is about um, the whole genotype phenotype argument that I think is somewhat silly. This is why I think it's so, somewhat silly. You know, uh, genetics are great. Genetics are going to tell you the stories and the possibilities of what your future litters could be. You know. Uh, I'm very big on genetics. I look back, you know, at least four generations and try to tie in the pros and the cons of every breeding that I do and try to narrow it down to what should I expect out of this litter and does it fit what I want. You know, now when we go into, the, you know, the looks of a dog, that's also very important because the genetics behind the dog has played a part into how, where this dog came to right now. So. It's like you can't skip a generation. I've seen more, uh, some people make the argument, well, I just breed towards the looks. I don't worry about the genetics because if the mom is a solid dog, you know what I mean? Evidently, you know, she's probably going to throw her look if I put her with a dog that compliments her look. That's stupid. You know, the reason why it's stupid is, is sometimes you have abnormalities. There's several dogs that you have that look nothing, and I'm talking about absolutely nothing, like either parent. And it, as a matter of fact, if you dig two, three, four generations, you start to look and be like, damn, this dog doesn't look like anything that came before him. Now, it could be many a different traits. Sometimes you just get a special dog that pops out of nowhere and is better than everybody. And other times you might, you know, have, the, uh, you know, it could be a disorder, gigantism, sometimes dwarfism. Those, those, uh, those things sometimes cause a look that we like because, you know, gigantism makes a bigger dog. Whereas dwarfism makes a more compact, bigger bone, bigger head dog. And those are traits that we like in the bully community. But we have to ask ourselves, do we want to add these traits to our gene pools? When you're doing the breeding, the best thing that you can do is an overall study of everything. You have to study the specimen in front of you to make sure that he or she has all the qualities that you want for your breeding. But you also have to go back through the gene pool and make sure that the gene pool matches so that you can, you know, basically you're doing um, analytics, you know. What's the percentage that I, my puppies are going to come out looking like this or that? What's the percentage that my puppies are going to have good hips? What's the percentage that my puppies are going to have a good top line? Whereas the, you know, then you're going, you know, you, well, I hope that y'all go into the heart. I mean, not just the heart, but all of the health issues that could affect these puppies. So you want to check on the hearts. You want to check on are the nares open properly? Uh, is the breathing going to be an issue? You know, you want to anything that came up before you want to be, you know, you want to have that in your mindset that this can come back. And especially if a gene is doubled up on, it can come back worse, especially issues like the heart murmurs and other issues of that nature. You want to make sure that you're winning on these issues when you do your litter, because remember, health comes before everything. If the dog can't live, I don't care how impressive it was. So, you know, sometimes you'll have to get rid of a certain stud. You'll have to remove a certain stud from your gene pool uh, or, or, or not use that stud for your gene pool. But if you get on point and everything works out for you properly, you'll find a better stud that matches what you're trying to do. This is how you create your real line. Because I've said this many a times and y'all probably hear me say it again. It's impossible for you to add good genes and not add the bad. So your basic plan should be to add the majority of the good genes and try to wiggle your way around and find a way to get the bad genes out. It's just that simple. We cannot play this game of, oh, I'm going to use him because he has a great front, but he's got a horrible back and a horrible uh, rear end. But this dog has a, a great back and a great rear end, so I'm going to put them together and they'll make a dog that is complete. That's stupid. You know, what might happen is he might not even throw his great front and just give your puppies the bad back in the <laughs> in the bad rear end. It works like that. You cannot, you know, manipulate good genes versus bad genes. So that's why a lot of times it's the process of pet quality versus show dog. You know, certain dogs that have these traits, they're pet quality for one reason. They shouldn't be bred. The dogs that come out show quality that have pretty much a night bat 90% where everything on this dog might not be perfect but is very good or suitable that's a breeding quality dog that's a sh you know and in most uh, instances that's a show dog now how great of a show dog it is depends on how you know excellent those features are but the one thing I'll tell you is a flawed up dog is a pet quality dog and in most instances it should be fixed so I guess we got into two different things on one rant 
But um, like I said, you have to put the whole puzzle together in order to decide how you're going to breed. It's never going to be as easy as just looking at a pedigree. And it's never going to be just as easy as looking at the dogs that are in front of you. It takes a lot of studying. And if you're responsible, you'll do the studying. And I guarantee you, you'll come out winning if you take the time and keep your uh, ethics right to not breed for money, but for, to breed for excellence. But until next time, I'll catch up with y'all later. Peace.